Have you ever sat through the masturbation scene in Evangelion and wished you could feel that uncomfortable for four hours? Well, have I got the anime for you. Watamote is a cringe comedy that's truly deserving of the name. Seriously, on the uncomfortableometer, this thing goes from zero to Scott's tots real fucking quick. But because of the nature of its comedy, it's drawn some derision from people who feel that it's exploitative. This, I cannot abide. In Watamote, we're confronted with a protagonist who suffers from crippling social anxiety, a real-world problem that many people, understandably, don't want to see taken lightly. But I would argue that despite the fact that Watamote presents Tomoko's various social shortcomings in a humorous way, her anxiety is still treated with nuance and respect, and the show's comedic elements serve to underscore the tragedy of her mental disorder rather than to make light of it. The first and most important way that Watamote uses its humor to get us to understand its protagonist is by juxtaposing Tomoko's perception of the world and the way the world actually is. Consider this scene from episode 3. This clip was removed due to copyright strikes. It was the one where she goes to get her umbrella, but it's not where she left it, so she thinks someone stole it, and she goes unhinged, and she vows revenge till she turns around and finds it in the other box. Yay! Tomoko's overly violent reaction to a relatively minor inconvenience is comedic, but more importantly, it serves as a demonstration of Tomoko's intensely judgmental nature. When Tomoko sees that her umbrella is missing, she immediately assumes that some asshole with friends must have stolen it, not considering even for a second that it's just behind her. Her instinctual reaction to other people is to be distrustful and to assume the worst, which makes her interactions with others significantly more difficult than they have to be. This is because she's seeing herself in other people. Tomoko isn't exactly what you would call a good person. While her classmates are playing basketball in the gym, she fantasizes about stealing their wallets. She cheats against children while playing totally not magic, and one of her go-to activities while bored is to chop down the fruit trees of players who are dumb enough to leave their gates open in totally not Animal Crossing. What a bitch. Because Tomoko fantasizes about acting maliciously against others, she believes that others must also fantasize about acting maliciously against her, which naturally makes communication difficult. We see Tomoko's propensity for judgmental thought in several other places in the series, and it's important to note that her expectations are almost always subverted. When she has to stay after school to do the portrait assignment with this guy, does he have a name? Hang on. Hatsushiba. With Hatsushiba, she says that he looks like he's never talked to a girl in his life, a judgmental statement based on appearance that references Tomoko's own inability to start conversations. He then turns around and immediately confronts her about following him, showing not only his willingness to talk to girls, but also to assert himself and speak confidently to them. The same kind of thing happens at Totally Not McDonald's, when Tomoko is afraid that her classmates are going to judge her for being in a place like this by herself. In reality, they don't even notice her until she decides to- OH GOD! Sorry, sorry, until she changes her appearance to avoid them, a decision that makes her impressively ugly, which draws attention from Tomoki's friends as she's walking down the stairs. If she hadn't changed her appearance, she likely would have been able to walk by everyone without being noticed, like she does nearly every day in class, but her fear of judgment is self-fulfilling. The fear causes her to take actions that cause the thing itself to occur. Not only is this fear self-fulfilling, it's also cyclical. It compounds upon itself to make itself worse. With every failure that Tomoko suffers, she has another reason to be hesitant to take social risks, and the more hesitant she is, the more likely she is to fail in the future. When Tomoko is standing outside the department store waiting for Yuchan so that they can go shopping together, she sees herself reflected in the window and wonders if she should roll up her skirt. Then, she gets flashbacks to this and vehemently decides against it. Now, I'm no fashion surgeon, but the skirt was not the problem with this ensemble. Even so, Tomoko remembers how attempting to change her appearance drastically backfired last time, and now she's unwilling to try it again. This is further exemplified by the fact that she and Yuchan are going shopping for underwear. Tomoko wants to wear sexy clothes so that she can feel more beautiful and confident, but she isn't willing to risk making a fashion statement that people will actually see, because then she would be opening herself up to disapproval. The sense that other people disapprove of her or don't want her around is what causes Tomoko to view social interaction, the thing that she wants most in the world, as a source of extreme stress. After she manages to stutter out a forced goodbye to her teacher after school, she has has an incredibly positive reaction. Even after this most minor of social successes, Tomoko is surrounded by a magical rainbow of happiness, and we see this same magical rainbow of happiness after she gets knocked out during gym class and is allowed to go home to recover, meaning that she doesn't have to interact with anyone else for the rest of the day. This exemplifies Tomoko's two conflicting desires, the desire for long-term happiness and the desire for short-term happiness. Consider this scene. Tomoko lays in bed, in bed, and she cries while she's saying, 
that she's so, so happy. happy. It's easy to interpret Tomoko's I'm so happy in this scene as trying to comfort herself by saying that she's still able to live the life that she wants despite her intense anxiety, but I don't feel like that really gets to the heart of it. So many times through the series, Tomoko has chances to speak with people, and those chances always make her intensely uncomfortable in the moment. By contrast, being shut up in her room and playing video games is one of the only things that leaves her feeling genuinely carefree, but that kind of behavior isn't going to get her any closer to her overall goal. Tomoko isn't crying in this scene because she's not happy, she's crying because she is happy, and she's being forced to confront the idea that isolation, the thing that makes her happy in the short term, is leading her to long-term misery. Her lack of social experience also leaves her unsure of how to improve her situation. In Tomoko's mind, the only realistic hope of social interaction stems from other people initiating contact with her. This is why the idea of an expressionless character is so appealing to her. She says that expressionless characters are lucky because their unwillingness to talk to people is perceived as cute. But when Tomoko attempts to take on the persona, she realizes that expressionless characters only work because somebody takes the initiative and tries to talk to them. Without that other person making the effort, Tomoko is just another silent loner. Again, this problem is self-perpetuating. The less she speaks, the more people believe that she doesn't want to speak. Let's go back to the umbrella scene. This is the second time that I'm re-uploading this video. This video. Because I left some copyrighted content in it last time. You fucking idiot. But even though they made no claim against it, I guess they suddenly care anyway. The point is... The point is... This guy tells his friend to stop bothering Tomoko. Tomoko. Cause she's a quiet girl who doesn't want any guys to talk to her. Anxiety. And Tomoko thinks that's just absurd, but she can't bring herself to say a goddamn word, so she points to the rain and says it's raining. And that's the end of the scene. Despite the fact that Tomoko desperately wants people to speak with her, the fact that she doesn't initiate contact leaves others with the impression that she doesn't want to be bothered, and the more she looks like she doesn't want to be bothered, the less people bother her, causing her stress and lonesomeness to pile up on themselves until she is literally screaming in the middle of the night for someone to help her. Of course, nobody's going to help her because that would require her being close to someone, which is the very thing that she needs help achieving. On the few occasions when she does come up with an active plan to change her situation, the ideas that she has are built on incredibly suspect logic. When Tomoko says that wearing underwear like Yuchan's would help her get friends or even a boyfriend, you have to take a step back and wonder what kind of people she's hanging out with where cool underwear is a prerequisite for friendship. Furthermore, her short-lived aspirations to work as a cabaret girl don't even get off the ground. The seedy, hyper-social nature of the red light district overwhelms her, and the scene ends with the city lights revolving around her as she stands still, left behind by a world that she's too slow and too shy to be a part of. The Coloration in this scene is also important, as the bright lights and neon colors that we see act as a twisted perversion of the magical rainbow of happiness from before. Lastly, when Tomoko wants to work at a trendy cafe in order to boost her social skills, she doesn't consider the fact that she barely functions as a customer, let alone as a waitress. But the particularly interesting thing about that is that when her desire gets twisted and she winds up working on an assembly line at a cake factory instead, all of her co-workers are very social and talkative over the break, giving Tomoko a perfect opportunity opportunity to form connections with other people on the line, that she doesn't take because she's too preoccupied with the fact that her dreams have been dashed yet again. But despite the fact that every one of Tomoko's attempts at fixing herself goes awry, she still does see improvement throughout the series, even if it's slightly too subtle for her to notice until the very end. The most noteworthy source of this improvement is her interactions with Imai over the last two episodes. Imai is the one who finally answers Tomoko's call for someone to come and help her out of her shell, but not in a conventional way. At first, Tomoko is grateful to Imai for being nice to her, but she becomes increasingly unable to communicate with her as her self-consciousness grows and she becomes afraid of overstepping her bounds. Despite the fact that Imai has been nothing but nice to her, it gets to the point where Tomoko runs away from her rather than risking communicating for fear of giving Imai reason to believe that she's a total freak. But Imai is able to overcome that distance that Tomoko tries to put between them and acts as the catalyst for real, lasting change in Tomoko's life by putting on a bear suit. When Imai hugs Tomoko in the bear suit at the end of the series, Tomoko is a little taken aback, but she's ultimately able to accept the affection because she's able to separate the tenderness of the moment from the anxiety of human interaction. While she inevitably interprets physical contact from humans in a sexual way, and often believes that kind actions from others are thinly veiled attempts at mocking her, she isn't able to project those same insecurities onto a bear. She's instead left with a pure gesture of understanding and compassion that will stick with her in ways that no other 
positive interaction in the series will. The most striking example of how Imai's influence changes Tomoko is how she reacts when her teacher tells her to be careful walking home after school. At the beginning of the series, all she can manage is a forced, silent bow, but in the last episode, she's able to properly say goodbye. It's still awkward, and she still has to struggle to do it, but she does it. And more importantly, she doesn't comment on it afterward. Whereas her first successful interaction with the teacher resulted in a magical rainbow of happiness moment, she doesn't comment on the last one at all, suggesting that Tomoko no longer sees a small interaction like that as a major victory. It's starting to become a normal part of her life. But the real indicator that this change in Tomoko's life is going to last comes from the series ED. Most episodes of Watamote end with Tomoko walking home alone, but the ED for episode 11 features Tomoko walking home with the balloon that Imai in a bear suit gives her. She carries Imai's influence all the way home, and then stands on her porch and looks up as a different red balloon flies past on screen. She stands there for a while as though considering letting the balloon go, but ultimately she decides to take it inside with her, signaling to the audience that Tomoko has internalized at least some small part of Imai's affection toward her and has begun to accept that she is worthwhile as a person. Finally, this sense of personal growth is reflected in the first and last thing that we hear about Tomoko. Here we have a particular girl, an unpopular girl, and her story that really doesn't matter. At the beginning of the first episode, this line has a condescending, almost mocking tone. It suggests that Tomoko is a sad and pathetic creature who isn't someone we should concern ourselves with. But when this same line is repeated at the end of the series, it takes on a decidedly hopeful meaning. This story, the story of how Tomoko's self-hate and inability to communicate with other people almost destroyed her life, doesn't really matter. Because this phase of her life is ending. I wanted to add a lot more to this video, particularly about Tomoko's sexuality and her interactions with other women, but considering eight of the 20 pages of notes I took are on that subject, I think I'm just gonna make it its own video. More Watamote! Besides, by that point I should have around 5,000 subscribers- Bark! Bark! What's that, boy? Bark! Bark! This was my 10,000 subscriber special. Bark! Silly person pretending to be a dog. This is my third video. There's no way I have- Holy shit! Guys, seriously, what the hell? I, I mean, thank you, but Jesus Christ, I expected to have like 200 subs at this point. But if you guys insist on making me a household name overnight, I won't complain. So share this video around, and leave ideas for future videos in the comments. I've still got plenty, but I want to see what kinds of things you all will be interested in seeing me do. And don't say Hunter x Hunter, because that has like 150 episodes. Until then, this has been Explanation Point. Signing out. Right? Yeah, yeah, signing out.